about you. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio and WBCA, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access Television or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I have five new movies to review for you for this show. Four are brand new movies that just came out this past weekend. One is kind of new. It's actually been out for three weeks, but I didn't get to see it until this past week. But first, I'm going to get into my usual first segment, which is what's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Many of them are hits, some of them are flops, but I will let you know the difference as we go through them. So actually, this is pretty surprising to me, but it's surprising and it's not surprising because this movie was a critical and commercial success already in just two weeks. But I am surprised to see it be number one in its second week, and that movie is Mission Impossible Fallout, the sixth Mission Impossible movie. And it grossed a pretty decent $35.3 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $178 million, Mission Impossible Fallout has so far grossed $124.8 million dollars here in the States, and $329.8 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a tentative hit so far. It should be certified probably by next week, if not the week after. The number one highest grossing debut movie of the week is the number two highest grossing movie of this past weekend, and that is Christopher Robin, the Disney film which is a sequel to the several Winnie the Pooh shorts that, and not to mention... TV shows that Disney has churned out over the last 50 years, literally. But Christopher Robin this weekend earned $24.6 million, so more than $10 million less than Mission Impossible Fallout, against a budget of $75 million, and it's grossed $29.7 million worldwide, which means it's not yet a hit here in the States or around the world, but it could be by next week. Of course, we'll have to see. The Spy Who Dumped Me is number three at the box office this past weekend. It grossed $12.1 million in the United States against a budget of $40 million, which means it's not a hit yet, and it's off to a relatively slow start, but it has a budget that's that's about half or more than half of Christopher Robin, so it does have a good chance of at least being a tentative hit. Around the world, I have no idea how much this movie grossed. I didn't get that information. Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again is number three at the box office, sliding from number, excuse me, is number four at the box office, sliding from number two last week, having grossed $9 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $75 million, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again has so far grossed a pretty impressive $91.2 million here in the States and $230.4 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, and a certified hit all around the world. I guess there are some ABBA fans. Well, it would be enough to assume that ABBA fans are all over the world. And it makes sense because ABBA is a Swedish band. The Equalizer 2, also in its third week in release, is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week. So I actually, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again has gross or has been ahead of The Equalizer 2 all the time that both movies have been out. But against a budget of $62 million, The Equalizer 2 has so far grossed $79.8 million here in the States and $87.4 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. It it hasn't grossed nearly as much as Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, and it probably never will, but that's probably because Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again has a greater appeal than The Equalizer 2, plus the fact that Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again is rated PG, whereas The Equalizer 2 is rated R. Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation is number six in the box office this weekend, sliding from number four last week, having grossed $8 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $80 million, that's $80 million, Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation has so far grossed $136.3 million here in the States and $35.3 
$337.9 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States. Very, very close to being a certified hit, but not there yet. But around the world, it is most certainly a certified hit, which doesn't rule out the possibility of there being a Hotel Transylvania 4, and definitely maybe not even a Hotel Transylvania 5, but of course we'll have to see. Ant-Man and the Wasp is number six in the box office this weekend, sliding from number four, excuse me, sliding from, let me start over. Ant-Man and the Wasp is number seven at the box office, sorry about that, sliding from number six last week, so not a huge slide, but it grossed $6.4 million this past weekend. Against a budget ranging from $162 to $195 million, Ant-Man and the Wasp has so far grossed $195.6 million here in the States and $427 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit, just eking its way to being a tentative hit here in the States, but at least it made it, and around the world it grossed most it, it is a certified hit so very good for ant-man and the wasp it's not grossing the numbers that black panther or avengers infinity war has grossed but it's still doing pretty well for itself the darkest minds is off to a very rough start it's the third highest grossing debut movie of the weekend but it's number eight at the box office in its debut having grossed just 5.8 million dollars here in the states and 9.9 million dollars worldwide and that is against a budget of 34 million dollars which means it's not even close to a hit here in the states or around the world and i doubt you'd be able to see it probably in the top 10 but then again i could be wrong Incredibles 2 is number 9 at the box office, sliding from number 7 last week, but it's still doing really well for itself. It grossed $5 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend, but against a budget of $200 million, Incredibles 2 has so far grossed $583.1 million here in the, here in the States, and it has grossed $1.05 billion worldwide. So it finally reached the billion dollar mark and it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Teen Titans Go to the Movies was number five at the box office last week. This week it took a huge slide to number 10, having grossed just $4.8 million at the U.S. box office. But the good news is that it only has a budget of $10 million and has so far grossed $20.7 million here in the States and $23.2 million worldwide. So it's not box office records, but it's still a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that reminder out of the way... The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Christopher Robin, also known as Disney's Christopher Robin, which is a sequel to the several Winnie the Pooh animated adaptations that Disney has done over the last literally 52 years. They've had several shorts, a few 
full-length animated features that have been released to theaters. And, of course, they've had a couple of very successful TV shows, a few that have been animated and others that have been puppets. And I've seen uh, quite a few of them. And Winnie the Pooh is probably the second most popular Disney cartoon character, or at least the most the second most iconic, second only to Mickey Mouse. But unlike Mickey Mouse, Winnie the Pooh was not an original Disney creation. And in fact, there was some conflict, just getting a little off topic here, but I'll, I promise I'll swing back to this movie. Uh, a couple of years ago, the estate of A.A. A. Milne, who created the Winnie the Pooh character, actually sued Walt Disney for, or the Walt Disney Company for unpaid royalties, but of course that was settled out of court, and apparently, I guess, the estate of A.A. Milne and Walt Disney are on good terms, because otherwise they wouldn't still be making Winnie the Pooh movies. So, unlike a lot of various remakes that have been released of Disney films over the years, including Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast, Christopher Robin is not so much a remake, but it is sort of reintroducing the beloved characters we've known over these years to a live-action adaptation here. So Christopher Robin in this case is actually a working class family man who's in his mid-40s and is played by Ewan McGregor. And he encounters his childhood friend Winnie the Pooh who helps him to rediscover the joys of life. In fact, if there's any film to which Christopher Robin could be probably best compared, it would probably be Hook, the 1991 movie starring Dustin Hoffman as the titular Captain Hook and Robin Williams as a grown-up Peter Pan. There are a lot of parallels between that movie and this film, but this movie still has its its uniqueness compared to Hook. But unfortunately, the timing of this film being released in the summer of 2018 is a little bad for two reasons. Number one, it's coming a year after the excellent and somewhat underrated film Goodbye, Christopher Robin, which came out... Uh, of course, last year, and that movie got a 64% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, but it was actually one of my favorite films of 2017, and it was so good, in fact, that I thought that Will Tilston, who played the young Christopher Robin, Billy Moon Milne from that film, would make a cameo in this film. He didn't, but I think that he at least deserved to make one. And second, regarding this Christopher Robin movie having somewhat bad timing is, it came out months after Paddington 2, which is another cute film and also a touching film about an anthropomorphic bear. And Christopher Robin, even though it is a good film, and it certainly gets to the heart of what made both the Winnie the Pooh cartoon by Walt Disney, by that I mean the original animated shorts, and also what made A.A. A. Milne's books, illustrated by Ernest Shepard, so special as well. I thought this movie did well combining the two, but it doesn't hold a candle compared to either Paddington movie, unfortunately. But this movie does have some strengths. I did like Ewan McGregor as the older Christopher Robin. I just wish some things had been left out or maybe cut from his story altogether. For instance, Christopher Robin has grown up to be a guy who is working for a luggage company after World War II, and it's actually established that he is that he is actually a World War II veteran, which is interesting because the original Christopher Robin Milne also served in World War II. But putting those kind of war scenes in a kid's film, I, I didn't think was the best thing. But then again, these war scenes were, I think, sanitized for a children's audience. It's mentioned briefly, but it is kind of questionable why it would be mentioned at all. But the Christopher Robin is married to a lovely young woman by the name of Evelyn, who's played by Haley Atwell, who is best known to modern audiences as Agent Peggy Carter from two of the Captain America movies, as well as her own short-lived ABC show. And also, Christopher and Evelyn have a young daughter who's played by a cute young actress 
in the movie, she's named Madeline, but she's played by a cute young actress by the name of Bronte Carmichael. But Christopher Robin, as a father, is a workaholic who doesn't get to spend enough time with his wife and kid, as we've seen in several of these kinds of movies. And once you actually see Christopher Robin reading a history book to his daughter Madeline rather than fanciful stories like Treasure Island, you kind of know where this movie is going. He's a workaholic who eventually finds his childhood self, especially when Winnie the Pooh comes to visit him in London in a somewhat contrived segment where Winnie the Pooh actually travels through a hole in a tree in the Hundred Acre Wood. His friends, Tigger, Piglet, Eeyore, and all the rest, have mysteriously disappeared, and the movie doesn't really explain where they went. The movie mentions heffalumps and woozles, but never shows them. And I was thinking that it it was kind of a missed opportunity here, but maybe they'll show them in the sequel. But among the strengths of this movie were that the voices of the characters here were really good. In fact... The voice actor Jim Cummings did the voice of both Winnie the Pooh and Tigger. And especially when he did the voice of Winnie the Pooh, he sounded exactly like the original guy who did it in the 60s uh, Disney cartoons, Sterling Holloway. His his voice was almost identical. And Jim Cummings is really skilled in that regard. But I also really loved Eeyore as voiced by Brad Garrett. He... He did a great job as well. And the animation on Winnie the Pooh and his friends are flawless. Again, a good combination of both the beloved Disney cartoon and the Ernest Shepard drawings from way back when. Christopher Robin gets my rating of a checkout. I think it is a more than a pleasant film, but coming after Paddington 2, it just doesn't compare. Probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay, I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Spy Who Dumped Me, which is the second movie that Susanna Fogel directed, and she also co-wrote this film. Uh, She's written for a number of TV shows, but has only had a couple of... Uh, movie credits to her name. She made her directorial debut in 2014 with a movie called Life Partners, which starred Leighton Meester, Jillian Jacobs, and Gabare Sidibe, amongst other people. And I'm surprised I actually never heard of that because I'm a I'm a big fan of several of those actors, actresses, especially Jillian Jacobs. But The Spy Who Dumped Me is a female-centric spy-slash-buddy comedy about two women by the name of Audrey and Morgan. Audrey is played by Mila Kunis, 
and she is a woman who has just got dumped by her boyfriend, who is played by Justin Thoreau, and Justin Thoreau plays a guy named Drew, and she was dumped in probably the worst way you could dump someone, probably the tackiest way you could dump someone, which is by text message, and that's where the film leads off. But she gets some support from her best friend Morgan, who's played by Saturday Night Live's Kate McKinnon, and Audrey and Morgan are unwittingly entangled in an international conspiracy when one of the women discovers uh, her, the boyfriend who dumped her was actually a spy. And this comes after the fact that Mila Kunis gets dumped. And Mila Kunis is, of course, playing someone who, when she gets dumped, you the movie wants you to think, and probably even Mila Kunis wants you to think, that she's in a precarious position where she can't find another guy who would be willing to date her. She basically has to start all over again. But, of course, we, the viewing audience, know that a woman who looks like Mila Kunis will have no problem getting a guy to go out with her. Mila Kunis could be wearing a fat suit to make her look 350 pounds, and she'd still be able to find a guy. That's just how Mila Kunis is. But in any event, I did like, actually, the chemistry between Mila Kunis and Kate McKinnon in this movie. Unfortunately, this movie was somewhat forgettable as a spy comedy. In fact, I think I remembered Melissa McCarthy's spy movie from about two years ago in terms of the plot points and some of the lines a lot better than I did this movie. And one of the problems of this movie comes in the title. It's not that it's a bad title. It's actually a very good title, The Spy Who Dumped Me. It's obviously a riff on the Roger Moore 007 film, The Spy Who Loved Me, which was also parodied by an Austin Powers movie, uh, The Spy Who Shagged Me from 1999. The problem with the title, though, is you think it's going to be at least partly about the relationship between Mila Kunis's character and Justin Thoreau's character. And it really isn't. When we're introduced to Mila, Kunis, uh, Mila Kunis's character, she's already been dumped. And you find that Mila Kunis's character, or Mila Kunis, is describing the relationship that the two of them have. You even find out through Mila Kunis that she's been dumped via text message. You don't actually see her get the text. So... What could have potentially been at least part interesting uh, part of an interesting movie about a relationship, what it's like to date somebody who's a spy and who's undercover as a spy, that would have been a great start to the movie. But the movie completely skipped that over and unfortunately started with the the spy action going on right in front of you. And when you're when it's eventually revealed from other agents from the CIA, consisting of Sebastian played by Sam Huhan and Duffer played by Hassan Minaj revealing to Mila Kunis that her boyfriend's a spy. It's just not all that really interesting. I think you kind of know that part is coming, but it would have been a lot more interesting if there had been some background exposition that had been shown to us rather than told. And no, the the idea of the Justin Thoreau's character having it revealed to Mila Kunis's character that he's a spy wouldn't have been surprising, but it would have been a lot more interesting. And another mistake this film makes is it relies too heavily on violence and not so much on gags. There's a lot of violent things that happen here. You see people get shot. You see blood literally spurting out of their chest, which is kind of, which is intriguing, but it's not funny. And if it weren't for Kate McKinnon, actually, this film would have been completely forgettable. In fact, the parts of the film that I actually remember are the ones that involve Kate McKinnon, especially when there's a part where the the two of them, Mila Kunis and Kate McKinnon, are undercover and they're at a Cirque du Soleil con um, show. And Kate McKinnon is backstage and the... The CIA agents are urging her to stay backstage, not to get involved in the act. But she actually does get involved in a flying trapeze act. And that part was not only very funny, but it was also fun to watch, albeit also kind of on the edge of my seat, literally, because I am so afraid of heights. So I think it was both the way Kate McKinnon sold that, that scene and 
h- how thrilling it was. It was both funny and thrilling. And that wasn't the only scene with uh, Kate McKinnon that I found funny. But it does show that Kate McKinnon has a very promising career after SNL. And I'm not sure exactly when she's going to leave SNL. She's been on the show for six years going on seven so it could be pretty soon but i think that very much like tina fey amy poehler and Kristen wig kate mckinnon does have a promising movie career after this i just hope she's in a slightly better movie so the spy who dumped me would have been a flunk out had it not been for kate mckinnon as of right now i give it a strikeout because it it could have been an intriguing spy film but unfortunately there wasn't enough time given to the character Character of Drew, the actual titular spy in this movie, to render him interesting. And I'm not saying that Justin Thoreau is a bland character. He certainly is one of those guys who is very charismatic and does create an appealing on-screen character, especially in movies like Mulholland Drive and even the movies in which he makes small cameos like Zoolander. Justin Thoreau is not a household name other than the fact that he was married to Jennifer Aniston, but I think that he would have been more interesting if they had actually focused on the spy who dumped the girl in question. And the fact that they missed out on showing the relationship was a complete missed opportunity and results in a forgettable comedy. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. show girl crystal aka the crystal lens we're coming to you from our new show called boston come through we'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around boston we'll be talking what black owned businesses social events what and the black experience how's that sound genevieve i love it dig it tune in every wednesday at 9 p.m eastern time on boston free radio boston come through come listen Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just as another reminder, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Darkest Mind. This is the latest movie that is actually based on a young adult novel by Alexandra Bracken. And... I guess the fact that it's a dystopian young adult novel automatically leads a lot of people to assume that it's very much like other dystopian young adult novels like The Hunger Games and Divergent. And unfortunately, they would be correct. So the main plot of The Darkest Mind is this. Imprisoned by an adult world that now fears everyone under 18, a group of teens form a resistance group to fight back and re- claim control of their future. So this movie starts out with a young woman by the name, sorry, the the internet's a little slow here, a young woman by the name of Ruby, who's played in her uh, teenage form by Amanda Stenberg. Uh, When we're first introduced to her, she's actually played by a younger actress, and she seems to have a good life going on with uh, two parents who are married and live in a comfortable upper-middle-class home. But then, eventually, there is a virus that spreads amongst the young people in this movie, and it gives these uh, these young people telekinetic powers. Apparently, this is an epidemic that is spreading amongst all of the youth. And as a result, it, it's a pandemic that's called IAAN, wh- whose initials I temporarily, temporarily forgot. I think it's internal adolescent something something. I, I know that doesn't make me sound particularly intelligent, but just go with me on this. But in, in any event, these, these young preteens who have this virus, which apparently has no cure, develop amazing psychic slash superhuman powers, but are consequently declared a threat by the government and placed in internment camps. 
And Ruby is sent to this internment camp on her 18th birthday. Excuse me, on her 8th birthday. And then she erase, accidentally erases her parents' memory of her one night. And eventually she gets sent to this internment camp where she stays until roughly the age of 16. Then a sympathetic doctor whose name who's, goes by the um, name of Kate, and she's played by Mandy Moore, breaks her out of this internment camp. And Ruby is not sure whether to trust Kate, but she eventually joins up with other young people who escape the internment camps, including Liam, who's played by Harris Dickinson, Zoo, who is a mute Asian girl by the name of Maya Check. And there is also probably the most interesting character in the movie, a guy by the name of Charlie, also known as Chubbs, who's played by a young actor named Skylin Brooks. So some of these actors are, are okay, some of them aren't. I am actually a pretty big fan of Amanda Stenberg. I, I saw her in a movie last year which was called Everything Everything, which was another movie based on a young adult novel. And as it turns out, Amanda Stenberg, probably not coincidentally, played a role in the first Hunger Games movie from 2012. Although, full disclosure, I have not actually seen any of the Hunger Games movies. It's just one of those franchises that flew under the radar for me. And once... Hunger Games Fever came to a pitch. I just hadn't seen any of the films, so I just kind of put them out of my mind. But in any event, while I didn't think Everything Everything was an especially good movie, I did like Amanda Sten Amanda Stenberg in that film. And I liked her in this film, The Darkest Minds, as well. But there are several problems with the film. First of all, these people who develop these... Uh, these young people who develop these telekinetic powers are on this color-coded system that reminded me instantly of the Department of Homeland Security's terrorist alert level. Do you remember that from the early aughts? Or, you know, it, it was one of those systems that was in place until Barack Obama became president. It was blue was a low level of terrorism threat. Green was slightly higher, then there was yellow, orange, and red. It never reached as high as red, but it also never reached as low as blue. And that, that terrorist alert system was just a joke, really. It's, it's one of those things that we can put behind us along with the rest of the Bush administration. But the, darkest, the, the problem with the character of Ruby in this universe is that she has developed the level orange, which is the highest level. And according to the government, people who are orange level must be killed off immediately. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the, the people who are blue, green, and yellow certainly have um, telekinetic powers, but it's not at a particularly dangerous level. In which case, why would they be in internment camps? But the other problem with this film is the idea of internment camps in general. When this book was written, internment camps were a fantasy or a dystopian possibility, but an improbability. But now with the Trump administration and their controversial tactics of separating Mexican children from their illegal immigrant parents... That's become a reality, and unfortunately, that results in this film being improperly timed. As a matter of fact, I think this movie should have been probably on hold until the situation with the Mexican families at the border resolves itself. But even then, even if it does resolve itself, which doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon, particularly with Trump as president, The Darkest Minds is just not a particularly well-explained film. As a matter of fact, the IAAN is only described once. The various levels of the telekinetic powers, green, blue, orange, are described very, very briefly. So briefly, in fact, that if I were taking notes when I was watching it, I would probably still be lost. And also... There is a love story that's brewing between Amanda Stenberg's character and the other guy who is who she's escaping with, Harris Dickerson, who plays Liam. And Harris Dick Dickinson 
doesn't act particularly well in this film, in addition to the fact that there is no chemistry between him and Amanda Stenberg. So The Darkest Minds is not a terrible film. Some of the acting is good, some isn't. Some things are hammy, some aren't. But it gets my rating of a strikeout. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I liked kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. Boston Free Radio has no corporate agenda. We're independent media for the people. Your music, your voice, your station. Hey everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. And if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio Sundays at 7 p.m. Right here. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Death of a Nation, which is the latest documentary or pseudo-documentary by a pseudo-intellectual, Dinesh D'Souza. Dinesh D'Souza's been around for quite some time. And he has been stirring up the ur of various liberals. And this documentary, should liberals choose to watch it, which is doubtful, is definitely no exception to this rule. Now, the description of the documentary on IMDb is as follows. This documentary draws parallels between the dramatic fact fracturing of the nation over Abraham Lincoln's presidency and the presidency of Donald Trump. So this description here implies that this movie will be a side-by-side -side comparison of Donald Trump's presidency and Abraham Lincoln's presidency. Let me tell you something. A lot of people draw parallels or find coincidences between President Lincoln and President Kennedy, and it is true for every one Lincoln and Kennedy coincidence, you can probably find about 10 non-coincidences. In other words, things they don't have in common. For instance, Kennedy was a Democrat, Lincoln was a Republican. Lincoln saw a second term, Kennedy didn't. Lincoln had a beard, Kennedy didn't. Kennedy grew up rich, Abraham Lincoln grew up poor, and so on and so forth. Now, th the, the issue is not only do Donald Trump and Abraham Lincoln don't seem not to have anything in common at all, but this movie literally spends a combined five minutes of its one hour and 49 minute running time comparing Donald Trump and Abraham Lincoln. Now, the strange thing about this is that on the poster of Death of a Nation, you see Lincoln's head on one side and Donald Trump's on another, and they're both together superimposed. But this movie makes a really weak argument that Abraham Lincoln came into office under the same situation as Donald Trump. In other words, the, the, Dinesh D'Souza, who serves as the narrator of this film not only the director, uh, the co-director, I should say, because he also co-directs this with Bruce Shuley, actually says that Lincoln was voted into office and he was an unpopular president, and his presidency or his election brought the country into civil war. If you've ever opened up a history book that's for fifth grade students or higher, you know that's not true. You know that, first of all, the nation being divided was largely James Buchanan's fault, not Abraham Lincoln's. And secondly, Abraham Lincoln was voted into president. He wasn't instantly popular, of course, but he certainly had his critics. But his election was not the reason the nation was divided. The same can't be said for Donald Trump's election. In fact, Dinesh D'Souza shows a lot of footage of TV shows, both news and infotainment, like The Daily Show and um, Bill Maher's um, show, which, the, the title of which I, I can't think of right now. And it shows a lot of footage of people saying that Donald Trump could be president and having audience members laugh at them, which I kind of cringe at right now. But the thing is, Dinesh D'Souza actually has the nerve to say that his 
previous film, Hillary's America, which came out in 2016, had a direct influence on Donald Trump's being voted in. Maybe it did to some people, but very much like his last film, Hillary's Nation, Death of a Nation is a film that preaches to the choir. This is a movie that will only appeal to people who are conservative and or to people who buy into Donald Trump's conspiracy theories and the like. But the thing is here that Dinesh D'Souza actually compares the entire the entire liberal, actually the Democratic Party from the 1860s to the present, he actually compares them to Nazi Germany. As a matter of fact, I would have it would have been more appropriate or at least more accurate to have shown the Death of a Nation poster as superimposing Adolf Hitler's face with Obama's face rather than Abraham Lincoln and Donald Trump. But of course, the former idea for a poster, even though it's a more accurate description of the movie, would not sell tickets. People would be so pissed off about that. I'd be pissed off about that. But the movie laughably states that Adolf Hitler, who's shown here in a dramatization to to which the movie Downfall from 2004 would put this to shame, it it actually states that Adolf Hitler, it doesn't imply or, you know, say that th- this could have happened. It says it actually did happen. It says that Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party actually looked at the practices of discrimination that Democrats practiced from the Civil War to the 1930s and used that as influence for his campaign against Jews and minorities, which is something that would anger me if Dinesh D'Souza had any credibility. But Dinesh D'Souza is a lot of things. He's a hypocrite. He's a bigot. He is a pseudo-intellectual. And primarily, he is a very bad filmmaker. This is not a documentary. This is a pseudo-documentary. This is where Dinesh D'Souza only interviews people who agree with him and does not have the guts to interview who anyone who doesn't. As a matter of fact, if you were to put Michael Moore and Dinesh D'Souza in a room, you know, full of spectators and have them debate, I can guarantee you Michael Moore would crush Dinesh D'Souza. As a matter of fact, I looked into Dinesh D'Souza's background. According to Wikipedia, he graduated from Dartmouth College in 1983 and was a member of Phi Beta Kappa which is very interesting to me because I can guarantee you that if he submitted Death of a Nation as a senior thesis, whether he wrote it down or submitted it as a movie, it would get a C- minus at most. And if it did get a C-, minus, Dinesh D'Souza would immediately blame the liberal agenda that, that colleges have when he should really be blaming the fact that his facts are unsubstantiated and won't even pass as conspiracy theories because conspiracy theories, by definition, can cannot be either proven or disproven. Just about 90% of the things he claims in this film can be disproven by a history book. So it goes without saying, Death of a Nation is one of the worst films of the year. It is not a documentary, and it is a flunk out. And Dinesh D'Souza is not going away anytime soon, but man... He's a bad filmmaker. Adopt U.S. Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. You've messed up your daughter's haircut. Do you, A, get spiritual? Mom, where's the mirror? Beauty is within. Oh. B, find the positives. Less time blow drying, more time texting. Or C, show empathy. Mom, you really don't have twinsies. I kind of love it. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. I love those real six sons. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing is Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, a film that's a lot more lighthearted than Death of a Nation. So I have to take a deep breath after my rant against Dinesh D'Souza and focus on a film that is a lot more lighthearted. Is it better? Yes, but I'll explain <laughs> what I think of this film. So five years after the events of the, tw- the 2008 film Mamma Mia, which was based on the hit Broadway musical of the same name, Sophie, who is reprised in this film by Amanda Seyfried, learns about her mother's past while pregnant herself. So this movie delves into Meryl Streep's character, even though Meryl Streep is mentioned last amongst the roster of other people who reprise their role in this film. As a matter of fact, everyone who is in the original Mamma Mia from 2008 is in this film. And this film, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, came out or has come out 10 years after the original, but it takes place five years later for some reason. But not that you would notice the age difference between any of the characters, but I just found that pretty interesting. But this movie delves into a lot of flashbacks where you see a young Donna who's played by Lily James graduate from college in 1979 and then go globetrotting where she ultimately meets the younger versions of Sam, who's played in this film and the last film by Pierce Brosnan. Then the other two, and this is where I need my my notes, if you'll just excuse me. The other two male suitors, <laughs> the, the first is, <laughs> if you'll just excuse me for one moment, Harry Bright, who's played by Colin Firth in this film in the last one, and Bill Anderson, who's played by Stellan Skarsgård. But in Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, you have the young Harry, uh, Stellan Skarsgård, excuse me, Colin Firth's character, who's played by Hugh Skinner. You also have the young Bill, Stellan Skarsgård's character, who's played by Josh Dillon. And finally, you have the young Sam, and I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to find, yes, here it is, who's played by Jeremy Irvine. So this is a... A decent prequel to Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, but very much like The Godfather 2, which, of course, is a much, much better film than Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. This film cuts back between the the past of the central character in the original film and also the present of the offspring of that central character. But, again, I'm, I'm reluctant to c- compare it to... The Godfather 2, but if I were to compare it story-wise, that's the movie which would probably be the easiest comparison. But this movie, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, didn't really have a story to it. The original Mamma Mia, even though it wasn't my cup of tea, did have a story, although it was definitely a chick flick. But this film felt kind of like one of those sitcom episodes from the 80s, you know, shows like growing pains or family ties where the family's sitting around a table and saying, do you remember the time where Alex did this? And then it cuts back to a previous clip from a previous episode. And then they go, then they go back to the present or, or how about the time Mallory did this? And then they cut back to a previous episode, you know, the clip show. Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again is not an extension, really, of these characters. And even Amanda Seyfried's character's pregnancy seems more like a a MacGuffin than an actual plot point. And and, and as a matter of fact, this film seemed like it, it ran out of ABBA songs to incorporate into its plot. Some of the ABBA film, uh, ABBA songs fit into the story really well. In fact, the scene where Lily James is graduating from college, they they incorporate a song I'd never heard of by ABBA, which was called I Kiss the Teacher. That it fit in really well. But when you find out that Andy Garcia is in this film, he plays a guy named Fernando, you know a certain song by ABBA is going to be included in this film. And it, it, it comes, as a matter of fact, from the woman who plays Meryl Streep's mother, who's actually played in this movie by Cher. And Cher is, just comes in and basically plays herself, even though her character's name is something different. 
but there's really no purpose to this film. I guess it's kind of fun, but you can definitely tell they ran out of ABBA songs when they start remaking both Mamma Mia, that song, and Dancing Queen. In a scene where the people don't even really dance. They, there's just a huge number of people who come in by ship, and they're just singing Dancing Queen. I, I, again, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of the original Mamma Mia, but I respect the people who liked it as well as the original Broadway show on which it's based. But Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again might be fun for a girl's night out, I guess. But it really wasn't a particularly good film as far as I was concerned. It was just a film that had some cameos in it. And even though I think that Lily James was actually good as a young Meryl Streep, if the film had just been maybe just about her and they they only had that and maybe had Amanda Seyfried make a cameo in the beginning and in the end serving as a narrative framework, that would have been okay. But... Splitting the two past and present stories 50-50 didn't really work for this film either. And I think that the the actor who plays Sophie's husband, I guess, husband with a question mark, uh, his name's Sky, and he's played by Dominic Cooper. They were engaged in the original film, but a little bit of a spoiler alert, they actually broke off the wedding at the end of that film. But this movie doesn't establish whether or not the two are married. And also, you can tell that Meryl Streep didn't want to be in this film because her appearance is reduced to a cameo. And also, even though Meryl Streep is still alive and well, her character in this movie is dead. Of what? I don't know. My guess is that symptom that comes in movies, which is exposition. So there were, I guess, some fun, fun parts to Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. It's not the best film I've I've seen it's not the worst film I've seen it's definitely not the best it gets my rating of a strikeout and also I was kind of curious to know in the five years since this movie took place did Sophie get a DNA test to find out who her father was the movie didn't even have that as a clever plot point and that would have been good hi I'm Danica Patrick watching my nieces grow play and learn is amazing but not every child gets to be carefree one in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed the five movies I had to review for you for this show, it's now time for my next segment, which is What's Coming Up Next? These are the most high-profile films, unless stated otherwise, that are coming out in theaters near you this weekend, unless stated otherwise. So the first films I'm going to mention are definitely coming out in theaters near you this coming weekend. The first one is called The Meg, and this is a film about a man by the name of Jonas Taylor who, after escaping an attack by what he claims was a 70-foot shark, must confront his fears to save those trapped in a sunken submersible. I don't know what differentiates a submersible from a submarine, but I'll see this movie and find out. It stars Jason Statham, Bing Bing Lee, Rain Wilson, and Cliff Curtis, amongst other people. So when I hear a movie and I, I hear that it's about a shark, I immediately, inevitably compare it to Jaws. But maybe this film will surprise me. I don't know. But it is a film that I will see for you, and I will review it for you when I come back to do next week's show. Another film that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is one called Slender Man. And Slender Man is based on some kind of internet urban legend. 
And it tells the story of a tall, thin, horrifying figure with unnaturally long arms and a featureless face who is reputed to be responsible for the haunting and disappearance of countless children and teens. So this movie could be either really good or really bad. I know they made a video game out of Slender Man. I remember watching uh, the Conan O'Brien show where Conan was playing Clueless Gamer. And if you ever get a chance to catch it on YouTube, I definitely... I highly recommend it, especially the part where he plays the game Slender Man. It's really funny how he how he fumbles his way through that game. But the film stars Joey King, Javier Botet, Julia Gondali Tellis, and Annalise Basso. Uh, it's a film that comes out in a year where we've had two excellent horror films so far this year, and the rest have been crap. The two I'm, I'm talking about, of course, are A Quiet Place and Hereditary. So, because those two films were extraordinarily good, Slender Man has a lot to live up to. Plus, it's a, it's a movie that's based on a video game, which is also a liability to it, but I will still see it and I will let you know what I think on next week's show. Another film I can guarantee you I'm definitely seeing is one called Black Klansman. This is a film that's directed by Spike Lee and could be Spike Lee's comeback film. Of course, Spike Lee never left and has never stopped making films, but a lot of the films he's made over the last 10 years have been of a smaller scale. They've either been documentaries or they've been or they've been films which he's actually shot on literally an iPad. But Black Klansman tells this true story of Ron Stallworth, an African-American police officer from Colorado, who successfully manages to infiltrate the local Ku Klux Klan, despite being black, and became the head of the local chapter. The movie stars John David Washington, who is actually Denzel Washington's son, and that sounds like a, a, a plot that is stranger than fiction. It also stars Adam Driver, Laura Harrier, and Topher Grace. And I'll see anything that Spike Lee directs, either good or bad. And that is a film I will definitely see for you and review for you next week. Another film that's coming out in a theater near you, it's actually coming out tomorrow, is one called Dog Days. This is one that's directed by Ken Marino of The State fame, of MTV's The State. And Dog Days is a romantic comedy drama that follows a group of interconnected people in Los Angeles who are brought together by their lovable canine counterparts. This movie has a lot of big names in it. It has Nina Dobrev, Vanessa Hudgens, Eva Longoria and several other people. And this is a movie I definitely will see. It, it could be kind of cute. Of course, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of romantic comedies, but I will check this film out, and I will review it for you come next week's show. And the last film I should mention, which may or may not be coming to theater near you, is one called Madeline's Madeline. Yeah, let me say that again. It's called Madeline's Madeline. It's about a theater director's latest project that takes on a life of its own when her young star takes her performance too seriously. The movie doesn't have anybody particularly famous in it. I think it has one actress named Helena Howard, who I'm not entirely familiar with. She's a young actress, and she's actually making her acting debut in this film as, guess who? Madeline. And, yeah, she's actress and mis miscellaneous crew. So I don't know if I'm going to see that film next week, but I'll, I'll look out for it, and I'll let you know if I do see it. But that just about does it with this episode of Words on Film. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the views and opinions having been expressed on this film about movies or otherwise are solely those of my own and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. And of course, as always, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. To check out my written reviews of the movies you heard, go to my website at www.wordsonfilmshow.com. And until then, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.